Good morning, everybody. Um, I actually don't really have a speech um, prepared. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, I, you know, I welcome all of you. God, there is a lot of you out there. Um, and you do all look really, really great. Um, my job is actually to facilitate a conversation. So I'm going to, I, I know that I feel personally, I don't know about you, but I feel like I should be up here with my dark glasses still. Uh, not because it's early in the morning, but because I'm still basically quite hungover from the elections. Um, so the fact that all of you still want to be talking about this when I just wanted to kind of crawl into bed for a couple of weeks um, is really quite admirable. So all I'm really going to say is that I can't wait to hear uh, what our panelists for our starting plenary are going to say because I do think that we all came out of the election, um, yes, half hungover, but the way that you're hungover after a really good party, where you're just, you know, you wake up the next day and your head is banging and just crying, but you want to talk about what happened the night before, um, who said some outrageous thing, who hooked up with whom, um, what, who did the most ridiculous thing that they're not going to remember this morning. And I think that's the kind of conversation that we want to have now and have it in good fun and but with clear eyes and to plan for what comes next. So um, I just really wanted to thank um, Rinku and all the staff at Color Lines and at ARC for inviting me. I am not Maria Hinojosa um, and I will take one 30 second uh, self promotion thing. For those of you who are not familiar with the show Latino USA, it is uh, the only Latino-centered national public radio program in existence right now, which I cannot, every time I say that, it's really quite amazing that there aren't others. There should be a bunch of us. Um, and we are produced out of Harlem in New York City by the Futuro Media Company, which is woman-owned, woman of color-owned nonprofit and most of our staff are people of color, so our staff is smaller than you out there, but looks a lot like everybody out there, and all our contributors um, look a lot like a lot of you out there. Um, and I think, and this program's been around for 20 years, uh, right about now, um, and the fact that we've been doing this work for 20 years, much like ARC and Color Lines have been doing this work for a very long time, we've been, we knew that this is what it was and what it was going to look like, and now we're ready to take the next step. So I think what is going to be good about uh, taking this time for this plenary is that because we're always on the run and we're always trying to figure out, okay, what do we do next? What do we do next? What do we do next? This campaign's over. Let's think about the next campaign. I think what's going to be good is to take a moment to really reflect and really just take that one deep breath. Um, that deep breath that is going to give us the oxygen for what we need. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about, about maps, about numbers, about plans, about energy. So I would like to bring up the plenary panel now. Um, that would be Kai Wright, Sally Cohn, Jacqueline Pata, Judith Brown Dianis, and Jesus Gonzalez, if you could come up. Come on into my salita, my galeria. And as they come up um, and settle in, uh, I'm gonna say a little bit, uh, just a quick little bit about each of them, some of which you will have read in your program if you took it, if you took a time to read it. Um, so starting from out and coming in, Kai Wright is the editorial director of colorlines.com. He's a fellow at the, that's right. Our sister, our sister media outlet, um, he's a fellow at the Nation Institute and he's the author of three books, Race, Sexuality, and African American History, and just, and by the way, has a fabulous radio voice. <laughs> he's been on our show, he does have a fabulous radio voice. Uh, next in is Sally Cohn, who's a writer, activist, and kick-ass TV commentator. Um, she, it, you can find her online at Salon, on TV you can find her in all kinds of odd places. Um, and you can find her writing in the Washington Post, in Reuters, in USA Today, in Politico, in Time Magazine, and all kinds of other places. 
Next to her is Jackie Pata. She is the executive director of the National Congress of American Indians, which is the oldest and largest American Indian and Alaska Native organization in the country. Um, and she was the deputy assistant secretary for Native American programs under Clinton. And she's on the executive board of leadership conference on civil and human rights. Uh, next to her is Jesus Gonzalez, no relation. He is the political director at Make the Road by Walken, and um, actually used to be Brooklyn, but now you guys are more like citywide, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he is, he's been working on a lot of campaigns around paid sick leave, uh, trying to get some of that legislation passed in New York State. And he is from Bushwick, Brooklyn, representing. Um, next to Jesus is last but not least, um, Judith Brown Dianis, who is the co-director of the Advancement Project and has way too long of a resume for me to get into here. <laughs> Let's just leave it at the fact that she has quite extensive civil rights litigation experience in around voting, education, housing, and employment. Um, so that is who's gonna be talking to you today. Um, so let me just say that we're not gonna have we're not gonna have these long introductions. Unfortunately, I know some of you are itching to interact with the panel, but we're not gonna actually have Q&A in this particular session. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, and I will warn our panelists that in the spirit of sharing space and you know everybody having an open voice, I will cut you off if you go too long. <laughs> so just know that. <laughs> so warned. Um, so to, as, a, as a way of introduction of each person, I actually want everybody to go down and talk for like 30 seconds or less about either their first or most memorable experience related to voting. So I'm actually gonna start here and go back out. So um, difficult, but um, because my first time voting, I actually voted for Jesse Jackson. So that was cool. All but, right. um, but I have to say probably this year, oh, they can't hear me. Probably this year, can you hear me now? Do no. you want to come up with it? Oh, wait. Oh, it's on. There we go. Wait. Okay. Sounds Probably. like you came online? Yes. Yes? Probably. No. Right. No? There nice. we go. There we go. All right. Okay. I'll move it up. Probably this year was, pro was the most, um, the one that probably has the most impression on my mind because I early voted in Maryland. Um, I uh, went with my 10 year old daughter and we got to the building on the Sunday. And the line was wrapped around the library, which meant about five blocks of waiting time. And I said, it's kind of cold. We can do this on Monday. And my 10-year-old said, no, let's do it today. And I, as a voting rights lawyer who's been fighting all this voter suppression, said, I guess I got to wait, because the 10-year-old, <laughs> I was like, I have to show, right? And seven hours. Mm. Mm. Seven hours to vote. Um, and it was, um, it was a wonderful experience, outrageous wait time, but wonderful experience because it was a community. Um, and people took care of each other. Um, people helped clothe us because we were not dressed appropriately. And um, we talked politics in the line. And black folks were pissed off about voter suppression and said, we're going to stay, and we're going to vote, and no one's going to take our vote away. That's great. Jesus. So I have to say it was about my second time voting. It was voting for myself, which was a little crazy for me because obviously before running at that time, it was last year, um, and so going with my parents, it was a really surreal experience, and then also, I ran in a district that was um, the lowest voter turnout in New York State. Um, so I, what did I just, you run for, by the way? I ran for state assembly last year in a special election. And it, was, it, was, it was awesome in so many ways. I lost by slim margin. But one of the things, I mean, two of, the, two of the, besides going to vote with my parents, there was this other experience where I went to go knock on doors. And this is the first time this community has really been engaged electorally. And, and so this woman goes, she's like, go away when I knock on the door, and, and she's like, I'm voting for Mr. Jesus, and she had no clue that I was at <laughs> Yes! See, that, yes. Is a, that is a winning campaign slogan if I ever heard one, vote for Jesus. 
and then, and then the other time was I was walking up the block and, and, um, and I said what's up to some young brothers and I went up to this um, assembly in, in the school and this young brother goes up and he's like, man, I'll tell you the truth, I was gonna rob that dude and he points at me. And he's like, I thought he had money. He was in a suit and he came <laughs> over and he started talking some real stuff. And, 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 he, and he, then he expressed that it was his first time voting. His first time voting was for me and that was just like, awesome. Um, but, but yeah. Okay, great. Wow. So Definitely. when I thought about this question, I thought, oh yeah, it would be like one of the times when I was at home in rural Alaska trying to get out my vote and, and, and from the very beginning always working on voting activism and marching in the streets and doing all those kinds of things. But actually, like Judith, mine was this time. And the reason being is because I was in Virginia and in Fairfax City, Virginia, of all places, and I'm you know, in a line that's not very long after I've heard about Maryland and everybody else because it's all very organized, right? And there were, um, an elderly lady came in, she was Asian, and they, people were you know, directing traffic there and they said, um, well, you're not at the right polling precinct. You need to go to this and this precinct and down this way. And you could tell that she had somebody else that was there bringing her to vote and she couldn't quite understand. And so, you know, they proceeded to tell her. Then another young man looked like it was the very first time voting. You know, they were going through the line saying, is this the right precinct, is this the right precinct? And he go, no, no, your precinct's not here. And by the th third time, they're asking somebody else about, is this the right precinct? I said, uh, excuse me, um, I'm not really sure that you have to turn away them from the voting in this precinct. And that they could clearly, if they're unavailable, un unable to go to another precinct, be able to vote. My husband's like looking down and he's like, oh great, here we go. Please, Jackie, don't start another fight. And I'm trying to be tolerant and it just wasn't happening. And so she said, um, well, I, I think you're wrong. And I said, well, I, I don't believe that I'm wrong. Did, you call, you, did you call the elections board? <laughs> so, yes, that's what I would have done. Like, uh, uh, well, I, I said, so they brought in the, um, you know, the, the state's um, voting person and everybody else to come and talk to me. Everybody in the line's looking, who's that lady? <laughs> Questioning all these issues. But what really was the bottom line was for me was, this is this year. This is in Fairfax, Virginia. This is in where everybody is. So voter suppression isn't just you know, in the small communities or the villages or the tribal communities. It's where we live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Sally. Um, so my most memorable voting related incident, it is an incident, uh, it was in 2004. I and a bunch of friends, I, was, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't on Fox News then or anything, I was still a community organizer, uh, and a bunch of friends, like I'm sure a lot of you, got in a car and decided we were going to go do something good, try and help John Kerry, who nobody really liked, but we thought he needed help, and boy did he, and anyway, <laughs> uh, and, and so me and a bunch of friends, uh, almost all of whom were white, got in a van and went to Ohio, and in Ohio there was, yay, Ohio, okay. Uh, especially this year. Yay, Ohio! All right. Uh, um, and there was the carry office set, set up in the middle of a, you know, 98% black district run entirely by white people, right? And one of the, I mean, we could go on about this. You all know the story. But um, one of the volunteers, sort of more involved volunteers, was a late 20-something like myself at the time, a young woman who had a t-shirt on. And it said, get your laws off my effing body. Didn't say effing, but you know what it said. Uh, and one of the other people you in the swear. office, I can say fucking up here? Okay. Uh, <gasps> Sally. The whole plenary just changed. All right. Uh, so, so she has this t-shirt on, right? And she's wearing this to try and like get out the vote, right? All right. One of the other people in the office is this 18-year-old young black man from the community. He is the only person from the community in the office. The only person, right? And he asks her, I sort of witness this while I'm stuffing envelopes or whatever, he asks her, what does your t-shirt mean? And she gets instantly defensive and like, well, it means, you know, you, but whatever. And like, I remember that. I was that like young, angry feminist at some point. Like she kind of does that like, well, how dare, you know, and whatever, and he didn't understand. And he's like, well, why does it say that? And what do you mean about the law? And whatever, and they're having this conversation where they're just, like here are two people who are on the same side and are just 
talking past each other, right? Mm -hmm. And here are people, well many people, myself included, you know, trying to come help our political process, uh, you know, but like totally parachuting into a community, not leaving any infrastructure, but not supporting anyone, not supporting authentic indigenous leadership. And here's this young guy who literally left the office mm. because of this interchange. His mm. first experience voting, these folks in his home. And he left the experience because we just couldn't, right? We're just talking past each other. And it wasn't about the politics, it wasn't about the beliefs, it was actually about culture, it was actually about community, it was about our ideas of who belongs and who doesn't belong and how we talk to each other. And it just became such a microcosm for me of how we do political work uh, beyond elections, frankly, that it, it stuck with me ever since. Shameful. Okay, the anchor, the anchor of this uh, relay race. Um, well, first off, good morning, everybody, um, from, from the Color Lines team. Thanks for coming and joining us. Um, I, you know, one of the occupational hazards of journalism is that you're often alone someplace in a foreign hotel uh, on election night. Uh, and so I'm, I, I, my, mine is sort of about an arc, you know, and so 2004, I also was in Ohio. Uh, uh, and I, at, as the, in, at the end of the night, I was literally on a dark highway between Ohio and New York. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Are you having mic issues too? No. Well, I'm just going to shout. I'm told I'm really loud in the first shout, instance. Just enunciate and project <laughs> All right. from your diaphragm. So I was, I, it, it, <laughs> Sit up straight. In, in 2004, I was on a dark, literally on a dark highway uh, between Ohio and New York City uh, as the election finished and all of my friends and community were someplace uh, um, mourning uh, what was going on and I was by myself. In 2008, uh, I was in Richmond, Virginia and I was, and I was uh, going from polling place to polling place and, and just overwhelmed by the, um, the, the wonderful community that Judith is talking about, seeing folks um, who looked like me and looked like the community I am from, literally standing along a highway. There was a, there was a polling place and, um, uh, and it was raining in Richmond that morning and people had lined up so far out of this church that they were standing along a four lane highway waiting for an opportunity to vote and in the rain. And, 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 and again, I was separated from my community. And so this year, um, I was able to go to the polls in my own community in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. Uh, it was right, rep. And, uh, and it was just, a, I, I was so happy to finally, because, uh, because now I'm an editor. And so somebody else was <laughs> off. Poor Britain and our and other reporters were off by themselves. Uh, and, uh, and I was able to vote in my own community. And, and, and it just was so moving to be there and, and to see my neighbors show up and, uh, and debate whether it was Verizon's fault that the, that the line was long um, and, 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 and just have this moment to be together publicly. And so I, it, for me, it's that arc, um, arriving at, at, at my own community. It's great. I mean, um, I, I actually have a confession to make. Um, I am a witness to and an abettor of actual voter fraud. Um, this, this, uh, we don't want to hear about this. <laughs> just, just wait, just wait, just wait. So, um, my, about a week before elections, my parents live in Florida, so they were, you know, my, I'm talking to my dad, and he says, oh, I did the early voting thing. And I was like, oh, okay, great. It's like, I was like, just checking. And Moreno, right? Um, so, the, the brown man. Um, and he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, well, what did my mother do? And my mother and my father have slightly different perspectives on politics. So I said, well, what did my mother do? He's like, oh, I, have, I had her vote for on Moreno, too. And I was like, okay, you didn't, I didn't hear that. You didn't tell me that. But, yeah, good. Uh, and, by the way, if you want to go vote again on the actual election, they go, go ahead and do that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, anyway, don't, don't rat me out, people. Don't rat me out. Don't rat me out. This yeah, is how it starts. Okay. True, the vote is here somewhere. For the record, <laughs> my father legitimately voted, my mother legitimately voted, and they've been Just citizens joking. for quite a while. Uh, this is all a joke, 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 joke. <laughs> <sighs> okay, come out. Can you help me out, please? Um, Deanna, help me out. Um, so, so let's get to let's get to the meat now. Now that we all get to know each other a little bit better around voting, let's get to the meat. So. I think one of the question, one of the ways of thinking about the question for me of opening up this broader discussion about what just happened and what it means is, 
did we win? Did we win? Because the, the, there's two parts of that question. There's who's the we and what does winning mean? So if you guys could, uh, if you all each could address that question and just think about and, and discuss with us what are the things that stuck out the most to you about this we and this winning, if there was such a thing. So um, I, whoever wants to start first, just jump right in. Get us going, Sally. No, I, uh, I have nothing to say. Well, I'll start. So, yeah, yeah, right. You have nothing to say. Uh, you know, I think, I, I think I, I, you know, I'm struck by Rinka's remarks um, uh, about the we. Um, I think that uh, it is uh, it is the most striking to, to, to all of the commentators on this, on everybody who's watched this election, that, um, that, that there's, a, there's a new understanding of, of we uh, in this country. Um, and um, the political system uh, is, has been slow to catch up with that understanding. Uh, and I think what is perhaps most striking about this election to me is the way in which the political system is noticing, oh, there's a new we. Uh, and, um, and, and we're going to have to adapt to that. Um, now, uh, did, we, did, did we win? Uh, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm a, a believer in, um, you know, I, I kind of think uh, in the Frederick Douglass uh, way about it. Uh, you know, this country is, is a project. Um, there's, there's a gap between the, the, what is a, a quite revolutionary founding document and reality. Um, and I think that it is probably a uh, forever project uh, on closing that gap. And so I don't, I don't, I, I don't tend to think in terms of win and loss. Um, the, the, the point is, uh, are we moving? Um, and, and I think there's a lot of ways in which we moved in this election. So I, I think that, um, hopefully I'm working, uh, that we, we won because we have changed the narrative mm. in this country. Uh, around what this country is about, uh, who makes up this country. We are changing what it means to be American. For so long, who is an American was defined by race. Um, it still is, but we have kind of changed the, the trajectory of that discussion. Um, you know, who gets to be American? And now, folks are questioning this. We had a staff meeting recently and I told folks that I think that one of the reasons that we won is because we are starting to see the death of white power. Yay. The death of what, and when I say that, not to be offensive to any of my white friends and allies, I'm talking about the structures of oppression in this country, that we are starting to see that. Um, that when we came together, we could stop voter suppression. It backfired, temporarily, it backfired. But we are starting to see that, I actually think winning is in the fact that people are scared of us. I love that that in fact people are taking note and saying, uh-oh, the country's changing. They're pissed, they're scared, they're anxious. You know, I, I think this is about a mourning process. When you go through mourning, you go through denial, you go through anger, we're starting to see the anger. But what's on the other side of this could be a beautiful thing. Yes. It could actually be what this country is all about. And so I'm excited because I think we are winning because we've put ourselves on the track to where we as a progressive community want and need to be. Yes. Okay. I say I agree with the we because I do think the we has made its statement and that's really clear. I think, um, I, and I also think that the we has a lot of power and we've got to claim that and we've got to continue to work it because I don't, I, I guess I'm concerned because as much as I wanted to after the victory and I'm all in the excitement post election, I'm not seeing that in members of Congress that we, you know, that need to come to that common place to be able to deal with the challenges that we're, we're facing right now. 
And I'm surprised that, for example, you know, the Republicans are still in that denial stage and haven't really felt the pressure that they need to feel from the we who I believe won. Well, and also, I mean, I think one of the things that, that we noticed is that we started having, and, and I think other journalists have had this experience too, where we would have Republicans come up to us and say like, oh, you know, we don't like the Republican Party either. They're not representing us. They're too, and, and, and this is a real thing. This is a real thing. So it's like, it, it is, there is this other part of the we that hasn't really spoken and also needs to speak. I mean, look, personally, I'm perfectly fine if the Republican Party wants to stay in denial for another <laughs> couple election cycles. It's okay, you know? I mean, <laughs> they want to keep, like, hoping that if we just continue to foment, you know, anger among white male voters that, oh, maybe it'll work out this time. Uh, as, you know, they see demographic trends entirely slipping away from them. You know, my worry, it's a complicated question, right? Which is why, I, I mean... My worry is is that we won, uh, I'm just gonna be a little simplistic, but we won sort of decisively around identity. I'm not clear that we won in terms of ideology. So, you know, okay, I guess it wasn't that complicated. Um, no, but I mean, right, like, in other words, the fact that we're still even having, look, the president clearly, somewhere along the way, he picked up some electoral votes in a backbone because he's like, looking like a guy who's actually going to fight for some stuff this time, um, right? But the fact that we're still having this conversation about the deficit, and we're still having this conversation about austerity, that we're you know, still sort of figuring, thinking that we have this little tiny pie that we have to start cutting from, uh, you know, as opposed to looking at how we can grow it and expand opportunity for all. You know, that conversation uh, did not die. That ideology did not die in this election. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if I see any prospects of that going away anytime soon. And I think that has actually more to do with us as activists and the conversations we're pushing and less about, you know, we have to be moving the conversation away from just cutting and deficits and toward opportunity yeah. and expanding opportunity. And, and, you know, I mean, part of the problem is that some of it's baked in due to the, the mistakes of, of, the Obama's, of, of the Obama administration's first term, right? Um, you know, this deficit conversation is baked in. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a certain level of financial reform that's baked in. And there's, uh, they have already deported uh, an enormous number of people. Um, and so, so, so from a policy perspective, um, we start at uh, a bit of a hole. Um, and I, I think it will be interesting to see what happens, you know, w whether or not the Republican Party comes out, of, uh, comes out of its denial space. It is interesting, and I do see um, a, 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 an emboldened uh, sense amongst some in the Republican Party that I think is important for policymaking, because like it or not, we have a two-party system. Um, and, uh, and to the degree that they won't show up, in a way uh, that allows uh, there to even be a policy conversation, we can't move anything. Um, yeah. So, um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I'll leave to the side uh, what should happen to them electorally, but, uh, but I would love to see um, somebody uh, on, on the other side of, of the aisle be able to sit down so that we can make some actual policy. Um, and we, understanding that we start from a hole um, from because of the, the mistakes of the first term. Uh, I actually, I'm, I'm going to hit pause for a second. Um, I, for the folks in the back that the sound is not coming through very well, I'm going to do what I do whenever I teach a class. It's like, do not sit in the back, come to the front. You know, there's only so much that we can project. And we're working on making sure that the sound reaches all the corners of the room. But if any of you are having trouble hearing the speakers right now, just make friends with people who are closer to the front. All right? All right. And I'm sorry, Jesus? So I think that there's, this real chat, I feel like Obama makes my job harder in, some many, in so many ways when we talk about um, the fact that under his administration, more people have been deported than under any other administration. I feel like it makes it complex. Like I, I feel like they, he has our scholars in our community putting themselves against each other because he's not delivering to our communities. I feel like when we talk about we, um, 
Like, is he represent, like, during the debates, and I voted for Obama. During the debates, he was talking about the middle class. And I was like, what about my parents, who, like, earn under $24,000 a year? What about the folks on my block who don't go to the hospital? Um, you know, how does this healthcare reform impact them? Um, and so I just feel like he was focusing in on the middle class, and I'm just like, man, what about us? Uh, so I feel like when we talk about this victory, obviously it was a tremendous victory because uh, I know f for me, I feel like it rekindled this sense of optimism and hope for some kind of change. And it also leaves a space to have some good policy victories in his last term. What the, what the impact of that, the result of that after that, uh, we'll, we'll all see. But um, I think that, you know, would we be out there marching if Romney was president and there were drone attacks? Are we just like, I just feel like folks, uh, there's, it's, it's more complex, right? And, and so I just feel like when I was just speaking to a class, um, a young men's group, and they were like, man, is, he has no choice. He has to be like that. Uh, like he doesn't have control. I'm like, the first black, every other president had control of whether or not we go to war, but now because it's Obama, he has no control for him to be the way he is. And I just feel like, you know, I think that our responsibility is to hold each other accountable um, and to make sure that we deliver. And I feel like our fear, our fear is like, I think that the, the underlying thing is like, he, he like, he's a brother, he's from our community, like he's representing our community, and the fear is, is to publicly criticize people from our community, right? Because obviously there's people, like, there's enough criticism out there, like even judging whether or not he's American, right? So, like, some th things that other presidents never had to go through, right? So we, we just need to be make, make sure that we, we're, we're accountable to our communities and hold each other accountable. Right? And so I just feel like, yes, it was a victory, uh, I, I don't know how I would have reacted if, if Romney won, but, um, but yes, we have a lot of work to do, and whether or not it was a victory for us all, you know, is questionable. Mm -hmm. so, um, so following up on that, um, if we're thinking about, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's always a good point to, to bring up, when there's this very clear, burning hot common enemy, it's really easy to organize. Oh, yeah. Super easy to organize. When the guy that the guy and his administration is somebody that you know is, in some way, one of us, it's a little bit. And, and yet he's doing you know drone strikes, deportations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it gets a little harder. It gets a little harder. And we already have gone through this for four years. So now that we get deep breath, second go around, um, what kinds of, how do we sustain that energy? And so how, what kinds of things are you most optimistic and pessimistic about in terms of, you know, sustaining the second half of the marathon? Um, what are you most looking forward to doing in the next four years? Or what are you just most, oh man, can I just crawl back into bed and wake up in four years and, you know, and deal with that? I don't yet see the road to jobs, um, uh, and and you know, uh, as Jesus was pointing out, you know, I mean, 25 percent of Black America lives in poverty, um, and um, and we have. I mean, if you, you, we are we, but we are many we's. Um, and let's be clear: if you look at what has happened to Black America since 2001, uh, since since the recession of 2001. Uh, and you look at from jobs to poverty to hunger uh, to debt, uh, it has been a steady and relentless uh, economic drilling. Um, and we have yet to see any prescription that is going to deal with that. Um, and ironically, the president has a great plan that would deal with it, his infrastructure plan, uh, which we increasingly need as we start having, as, as New York City becomes the Gulf, um, and we, we, we start living in a very different world due to the climate change. Um, there, there's, there's, there's existing and in, in greater infrastructure need, and that, that would create a whole lot of jobs. Um, 
and, uh, and would go a long way towards dealing with some of the problems in the black community economically. But there is not a, very, there is not a clear plan yet. Um, our, our, our political road to uh, that kind of uh, federal spending that is going to be required uh, to interrupt what is, can only be described as a depression uh, in, in, in majority black cities. Um, and, and that I remain quite pessimistic about. And I'd say for our community, it's just slightly, a little, uh, jobs and economy are still the number one, just like everybody else, we care about it. Um, our, un, our systemic unemployment makes it even harder. And for the president, what we need this time around, which I have to say for Indian country, he was fabulous. He was the first and only president that actually endorsed Indian country in the way that he did and allowed us in the doorsteps um, to be able to be at the table around national policy. So we got included in you know, Obamacare and uh, for the first time in a major pieces of legislation. But for us, it's this recognition of our political subdivision, different than just a minority, this recognition of our trust relationship, which gives us those economic tools. So all the other governments in the country get to have things like tax exempt bond financing that can stimulate, stimulate economic opportunities. For Indian country, we still don't have that opportunity. So we don't have governmental parity, even in our pension programs and other things, we don't have governmental parity. We also want to be able to have that recognition um, so that we can deal with, uh, you know, we're getting ready for the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in 2014. So we want to be able to make sure that this president actually makes that statement that tribes are equitable governments in this country and that puts us as people at a more equal playing ground to use the resources like job enhancement tools, energy development tools that other governments get to use. Jacqueline, actually, can, can we just pause for a second? Because I know that, um, you know, even as somebody who has actually looked into and tried to like become educated on a lot of these issues, can you talk for a quick second about what are some of the um, obstacles or issues around achieving this parity and really having um, native communities and native, nation, and native nations be recognized and treated equitably? You know, I think uh, it, partly because we've always had, you know, first we got the conqueror thing happening. So we got the conqueror coming over, you know, um, to Americas, and they always want to have that suppression. So we've got to keep us in our right little territories and our right little areas. And then on top of that, we want to be able to say, we get to make, as the government, the federal government, we get to make all the decisions regarding your um, sovereignty. So we recognize you're sovereign, we say that in the Constitution, and, and that's great, but we want to make all the decisions about your economic, your commerce, and also about your social programs and your um, law enforcement. So today, in reality, what that means, because I know you don't want to go through my whole history lesson here, but what that really means is like violence against women. We're fighting for the, the, the ability in our tribal communities, in our tribal courts, like other governmental courts, to actually be able to prosecute a perpetrator, perpetrator who is non-Indian. So if a non-Native comes to our community, violates our women, abuses our children, guess what? We don't get to deal with it in our courts. We've got to find another venue for doing that. And so many times it goes away. That's what it means in reality about governmental parity to us. Okay. Can, can I just stay on the, um, hello, hi. <laughs> I'll just talk into my chest. Um, uh, just on this like, you know, some larger like what's next, what's happening, you know. Um, my anxiety, it's an intimate room I'll share, uh, is, you know, uh, the first time around we actually didn't help elect President Obama. We didn't. I mean, we voted for him, right? But I mean, in terms of actual political muscle and infrastructure, the left, right, a, a, as a whole, and its different parts, weren't really that essential. And in fact, the president, uh, and his administration, in, in sort of unprecedented ways, spent the first term keeping the institutional left at arm's length. And there's this way in which, uh, and I, I find this to be a really useful framework, uh, you know, the right and the, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans both fear their base, but they fear their base in really different ways. Mm -hmm. The Republicans fear their base as in, oh, we better do what they want or else, right? Democrats don't fear us that way. They're like, they fear us like as in, oh, we don't want to get too close to them and look like we're, you know, with them, right? 
they don't feel accountable to us. They don't feel like if they don't do stuff for us, they're going to pay a price. Uh, they don't, they don't, you know, th there's no, uh, you know, well, I mean, uh, the best analogy is, in fact, to the Tea Party. I mean, I'm sorry, and they're, I think, dying right now, and, and good on them for that. Godspeed. But, you know, uh, <laughs> but even still, like, look, we have a long history of racial and gender justice movements in this country and, and economic justice movements in this country and even still our ability to exert political power in a real concrete sense, both in terms of electing people and holding their feet to the fire, was literally eclipsed in just a few years by you know, a small band of uh, you know, ragtag Tea Party people, right? Enormously well-funded. Enormous, uh, oh, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but like, come on, right? And that has something to do more with this sort of deeper political orientation uh, about the Democratic Party, always wanting to, you know, sort of seem centrist, always wanting to run, you know, oh, no, we're not gonna do favors for this side or that side or whatever. Uh, and I think somehow, again, I don't know if that's gonna change in the second term. I don't think temperamentally he's gonna change it on his own. I think it's only gonna change if we change and we become a force for not just having his back, but pushing his back up against the wall, frankly, when it needs to be. So Governor, Governor Deval Patrick in his speech at the DNC convention said the Democratic Party better get a backbone. Mm. Um, and that was serious that he's, I mean, for him to have had a keynote speech and have said that, um, what that means for us is that, you know, Yes, I'm very proud of having a black man in the White House, but we need to start holding him accountable. Right. We cannot continue a love fest yes. with someone who does not take care of our interests. Mm -hmm. We cannot continue to have a love fest with a party that does not really care about us. When it comes time for redistricting, we see that what happens in the Democratic Party is that a white Democrat is better than a person of color Democrat when they divide up the political pie. And so when we see the discussion around comprehensive immigration reform starting, we should know that yes, Hannity has said he's changed his mind and that there are other Republicans who are starting to change their minds because they feel enlightened by the demographic shifts. But we have to make sure that the party that is supposed to be on our side doesn't cave to get to the middle. And we can't do that if we're quiet and we're hugging him and we're praising him and I'm telling you this because I know what happens to leaders that try and hold this administration accountable. They don't mm. like it. He I said no drama. Yeah. And he meant that. But it's incumbent upon us to decide that we will take you on. Because if we take them on, we can start moving them left, left, left because there's another election. And so when 2014 comes, we need to show in force what we mean by holding them accountable. We've got to turn out more numbers. We can't let 2014 look like 2010. Mm -hmm. We just can't. And so I just think that, you know, there's, I have, a, a, you know, not a whole lot of optimism about the policy agenda unless the people in this room and everyone that we know decides that we're going to do something differently in this second administration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited to help figure out how to keep up the momentum. What's interesting is, is that this time institutions did kick into play to re-elect our, our president. Um, you know, for, for our organization in New York City, we was able to register 11,000 new registers, new registrants. In, in Pennsylvania, 7,000 in two months. Um, and he won Pennsylvania. And I feel like thinking about how to organize those folks is really um, awesome and like gives me encouragement, like gives me a sense of encouragement to think that we're gonna be able to hold the president accountable when it comes down to immigration reform. Uh, 
you know, Obama needs to think about new, new funding streams to balance the econ economy and not renew the Bush tax cuts. It needs to pass marriage equality. It needs to, it needs to be accountable to our communities. And I think that um, uh, this time around, I'm really, I'm really excited and enthusiastic to see those things pass. I have one thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know what? I, I, I've been thinking about this a, a lot too because I, 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 I totally agree. We've got to hold accountable. And you are seeing people getting elected who are more centered now. You know, like mm -hmm. Tester kind of, it was a great win for us. Wasn't, you know, uh, Nate Silver didn't um, predict it, but for us it was a great, great win. But he moved himself away from the party so that he could get elected. So you're seeing people coming to the center. But what I've thinking, been thinking is that. You, we still have this political challenge in Congress, and nothing's getting done, and we still have the sides so polarized that you know it's hard for them moving things together. I actually really believe that it's the people, it's the American people who are going to change politics for the future. It is not going to be the politicians. And if we let the politicians or rely upon them to solve our problems, we're in trouble. You know, the 99 percenters did a great job by getting the people engaged about an issue, and we didn't, but we didn't sustain that. And we have to, if we're going to deal with the economy, we've got to take personal responsibility, just like we take personal responsibility for climate change, and we do our recycling, we've got to take personal responsibility for the economy. And we've got to figure out what that means for us, because we're going to be the change artists. I don't believe the politicians are going to be it. Did you want to say something, Yeah, I want you know, when it, 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 it struck me in talking about, you know, from the Tea Party to how the, uh, whether the Tea Party is dying or not, and, and, and how, uh, how, what's going on at the national and federal level. One of the things that's really, really striking, talking about the 2014 election, mm -hmm. is what happened in the 2010 election and what it means for us today. Um, I cannot tell, it's almost gotten to the point on color lines where, you got to throw in a boilerplate paragraph about, well, thanks to the 2010 elections and the sweeping of state legislatures um, from, from Tea Party Republicans, the following has happened. If you, from reproductive rights to immigration reform to voting rights, very clearly, um, the amount of damaging discussion and policy making that took place from the states as a consequence of that election is just striking. Um, and, um, and I think uh, we would do well to right now be in a conversation about how to have the energy at 2014 and at state level com races that we have uh, around national level races. Um, and, um, and, and again, it, it, it particularly stood out for us in, in covering voting rights in the course of this year um, and how much. Uh, these states, uh, these, these Tea Party Republicans changed laws to muss, to muss up early voting and registration and, uh, and who gets to be a poll watcher and well, all of this. Well, let's, let's get into those issues a little bit more, right? So um, one of the, probably the big story around voting this year uh, was what's going to happen with early voting, provisional ballots, with uh, all these voter ID laws, with all these different things that were happening around um, access to the vote, access to the vote. Um, so let, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail because I think it's very important that if we are going to map out, you know, where do we go January 1st, 2013? Where do we go Election Day 2014? We maybe pull back a little bit and look at exactly what did happen. So let's talk a little bit about numbers and efforts and what, you know, a little bit more of the nitty gritty. So um, maybe you want to talk about the Voting Rights Project? Indeed. Uh, so we, amongst the things that, that we did, uh, color lines in, um, uh, in looking at this election, we said, well, you know, there's a lot of ways to invest your time uh, as a news organization. You can, you can embed reporters with each campaign and tell you what they said today. You can, you can put a lot of money in polling and say who's winning or who's losing. Um, it's, it's very clear to us um, uh, and 
uh, and a lot of folks uh, in this work that's really starting in 2000 through today. There has just been, well, really, frankly, starting at the beginning of the country. But, um, but from 2000 to today, there has been uh, a steady and intensifying battle um, an effort led by, let's be clear, the Republican Party to roll back a generation's worth of work in expanding access to democracy um, uh, and, and dealing with the realities that we've been talking about this morning about the changing face of America and the new we. Um, and, uh, and the Republican Party had a very clear strategy. Either we were going to peel off some of, we're going to peel off who we can. Uh, uh, hopefully we can convince black people to be homophobic. Turned out that wasn't true. And hopefully we can, uh, and, and hopefully we, it, it, and, and they were, and you, you, we forget, but uh, the Bush's first term was supposed to be uh, a, an opportunity for immigration reform, but the xenophobia that swept the country after 9-11 made that. Uh, impossible for the Republicans. Um, so they were left with suppression. Um, and, and they have been doing that uh, in, in a very aggressive way over the last uh, now 12 years. So when we decided to cover this election, we decided to partner with uh, the folks at Advancement Project, Judith, uh, Color of Change, get ourselves invested and informed about this sort of thing. Um, and, um, and with uh, our good friends at The Nation magazine, who uh, I hopefully are, are here, they, it's my other uh, home as well. Um, and just pour a lot of resources into being spread out at the state level. Um, one of the things we did uh, was, uh, you know, you hear, particularly in this conversation, but in all the political conversations, there's a lot of, God bless them, there's a lot of white men talking about politics. Um, and, uh, and about communities. Um, and so what we wanted to be able to do was to have people who are in the field fighting for their own rights, talking about voting rights. Um, so one of the things we wanted to be able to do is recognize some of those folks here. We, we, we recruited, with the help of the Advancement Project and Color of Change, uh, 15 community journalists who were people in some of the places where this was happening. Uh, a, a number of them are here with us today. If, are, are any of the, if you're in the room today, if you'll stand, please, if you're one of the Color Lines community journalists so that we can recognize your amazing work. Um, a number of them flew in from the West Coast late last night, so they may not be able so we'll have opportunities to talk to them and the reporters on the project um britain mock and uh, right let's get britain a, a round of applause and 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 ara bagoda um at um at the uh, uh the workshop following this on voting rights but i want we wanted to quickly show a video that came out of this um, because I think what happens is, and Judith can talk about this in more detail, what, what, what has happened is th there's sort of a climate change debate going on uh, inside uh, the debate over democracy, right? There's this assertion, of, uh, uh, absent all proof to the contrary, um, that there's a such thing as voter fraud. Um, and absent your, your parents, <laughs> um, that, that, that there's a such thing as voter fraud. And it has required um, the good folks at the Advancement Project and the good folks in the advocacy community to spend a lot of time and energy debating whether or not the sky is blue. Um, and, 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 and that uh, becomes confusing deliberately to a lot of folks. And our shot a video on election day uh, that I think we want to show um, that uh, at, at a polling place in Colorado um, that strips away some of this complicated debate about whether or not there's voter fraud and, 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 and reveals what they're actually talking about. Um, so um, I think it, the video speaks for itself. Uh, I, I can, can we cue that up? I just 
So uh, this is not, this does not, the population is voting is not representative of Aurora's population. Even look at the people, look at the people who got killed in the movie theater, you know, 12 of them, I don't know. If you look at the, the racial mixture of those people, if you look at those kinds of things, what we're seeing here is triple the number of people of color at this location. That's because they've been directed here. Maybe it's a website, I don't know what's going on. Because you know, so I was shot that video on election day, um, and um, and it just and, you know and it, it boils down the point um, that uh, the idea is to make it sound more complicated than it is um, uh, by uh, spending an enormous amount of time and money on generating harassment legal legal actions basically um, and um, and gumming up the conversation. Uh, to make it about law when in fact it's about trying to keep people of color from exercising democracy. Um, and so we were really proud to have the help of our community journalists to be able to do that. We were really proud. I'm, I'm hoping we can, we can uh, uh, prompt Judith to talk about it in some more detail. Um, we'll be talking about it in, um, in, 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 the, in the workshop that follows this plenary. Um, uh, but I think that it's, uh, it, it was, uh, the, 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 the crucial issue to me in this election uh, was, was our access to the polls, and I think it's going to be the crucial issue in, uh, in, in elections for, for a bit to come. Can I just, can I just add, for people who don't know, um, just yesterday, this is not like also an isolated incident, just yesterday, the head of the GOP, the head of the Republican Party in Maine, said like the same thing. It was like he watched this and was like, well, I know what I should say. That sounds great. I'll say that. And he's like, where do all these black people come from? We don't know them. Dozens. Where do they live? There's right. dozens of them. Dozens of and them. I don't know dozens. them. That's about all they have in Maine, are dozens. But they were all voting. Literally said, we don't know them. Yeah, we don't know them. Yeah, we don't know them. I was right. like, you know, it's funny. I hear that and I think the problem's you. But anyway, go on. So, I, <laughs> so as I said before, I have a 10-year-old daughter. And so if we're playing Uno and she gets down to the, and I get down to the last card, She's got 10 cards in her hands. She decides to change the rules on me. <laughs> so that when I put down the card, the second card, like I can't just pull my hand up and say uno. I had to have said it when I put the one down. She changes the rules, right? Because she sees the win coming. So that's what Republican legislatures do. that the only way to win was to change the rules. So 2010, they took over, and then they said the first thing they got to, in Texas, it was emergency legislation to have voter ID laws. Um, Rick Perry said, this is an emergency. First thing he wanted to deal with, you know, you got bad finances, budget problems, no, 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 it's this voting thing. And so it was all built around years of them talking about voter fraud, right? And it, so this wasn't new to us that this was happening, but you know they had figured out that they could like just say, you know, there's rampant voter fraud. It's the Fox News thing. They say, they say you don't do that, but the rest of them do. They say um, that there's voter fraud. That there were buses of Samoans bust into someplace somewhere. And they disappeared just like a UFO. And wow, I want to see that movie. It is, yeah. I mean, you it is incredible. The new at the party, they're everywhere. Right. It's they're those Black everywhere. Panthers there. And so show of hands, how many new Black Panthers in the world? <laughs> Y'all are cheating and stealing. Right. So they created a narrative that continued on that became the battle cry for 2011 and 2012 to pass these really restrictive laws that made it harder to register and harder to vote. And so um, as we saw that happening across the country, you know, groups, democracy groups, civil rights organizations, civic engagement groups, um, really the progressive community really rallied around fighting back. 
and we actually did some messaging. Advanced Project worked with the Brennan Center and we did some messaging so that we knew how to talk about this because their narrative changed. They were first saying rampant voter fraud. And then we started pushing back on that, right? Like, where's the evidence? Like my, you know, I always say, you know, I've got more evidence of Santa Claus than you do of voter fraud. Um, and so we started pushing back. And as we pushed back, they stopped that and they changed to, we're preventing fraud, right? And so our narrative became, you're not preventing fraud, you're preventing voting. And so we kept, you know, they kept trying to move off because they kept getting beat at their game. But they were trying to pass these laws. We, 34 states took up the restrictive one. At the end of the day, nine states actually passed it. We were able to stop those, um, most of those from being implemented, advancement project filed litigation. Our team, um, so um, along with groups like the ACLU, the Lawyers Committee, I mean, we all did like incredible legal work to stop these things from happening. But as we saw, um, the GOP was pretty relentless, right? And so you have people like, so Florida, they cut back early voting from 14 to eight days. We saw the long lines in Miami-Dade. We had people waiting for eight hours in line. Um, in many polling places for early voting. Souls to the polls got switched to one Sunday before and that Saturday, you know, was called um, Operation Lemonade because they decided that we were gonna make lemonade, get it better. Okay. And then um, in other places, Ohio. You know, the Secretary of State of Ohio is crazy. <laughs> he didn't, you know, it was like, he, he, in fact, he didn't even care what the court said. He said, I don't care what you said, I'm doing it my way. And so he keeps getting slammed down, even in fact, a few days ago, we got a court order in the case that we filed around provisional ballots, because provisional ballots, if you file it in the wrong precinct, and like places like Cleveland have several lines, you get in the wrong line, if you file in the wrong precinct, it doesn't get counted. We filed a lawsuit so that it would get counted up ticket for president, statewide. So we won the case, you know, here this guy at the 11th hour comes up with a form for the voter to fill out with their provisional ballot. So if they make an error, it gets thrown out. And the court called him back in after election day and said, that's not what you said you were gonna do, why? You know, I mean, so, and the court is like upset, but this guy doesn't care. So we have to understand that this changing demographics thing that we, we love is really driving them insane. <laughs> and, but they're, but they're smart too, right? So insanity leads to invention. And so all of these laws are being created to actually change, make sure that the power piece that I talked about before gets embedded. And so I think the challenge for us is to not forget. The challenge for us is to make sure that the voter suppression that we stopped, and I'm telling you, it was a temporary stop. In Pennsylvania, where we won the case, they're gonna keep moving forward with that ID law. And we know that 21 million Americans don't have photo ID, and so we are going to have to continue this. For Advancement Project, that means you all need to sign up at right to vote at advancementproject.org to get on our list to join the revival of the voting rights movement because we have got to have a constitutional amendment for a right to vote that standardizes it, that makes courts respect it, that makes states respect it. It should be a federal level issue, not a local issue. We have 13,000 election jurisdictions in this country that run elections 13,000 different ways and we have to stop that. And so the challenge for us is to not forget to be involved, to continue this. The media is off of it. The day after election day, I got canceled on every show I was scheduled for. Because they said there was no voter suppression, we don't need to talk to you anymore. So that means it's on us. And I hope that you will continue to fight with us on these issues at the state and national level. And this is, I mean, this is such an important point. <laughs> is the canceling you on every, because there is now a mean, there is now a conversation developing that, oh, it was all blown out of proportion. There was, a, which is like saying, well, I'm in a hurricane and I got an umbrella so it's not raining. Mm. And because of all the work that was done, it, we, it, absent all the work that was done, we'd be looking at this video and not laughing. Mm. That's right. There would be a very different conversation today right. uh, had, the election been close enough in Colorado, or Ohio, or Florida, for them to do what they planned to do. 
um, or if all of this work that was done between 2010 and 2000, and, and, and that is going to have to be done, wasn't done. We also just need to understand at the, at the foundation of this conversation is around whether or not voting is a right or a privilege. And there are people that want to make sure that it's a privilege. So that means going back to whether or not you own land, whether or not you could pay a poll tax, whether or not you could read. And there are those that think that poor people shouldn't vote because that's like giving them burglary tools. Matthew Vadim, look him no. up, okay? Mm -hmm. Matthew Vadim says that. You know, this is about the Obama gifts, yeah. the entitlements, and that you're gonna vote yourself to entitlements and welfare. That young people shouldn't vote because they don't know anything yet. Oh. So we need to understand that this is about all of us and whether or not we're gonna have a say in what happens in this country. Can, so can, very can, quickly, oh. very quickly, sorry. Um, and, I'll, I'll get to you, Sally. Um, so very quickly, what did we learn about, I mean, I hate dividing up voted, you know, our grand voting public into these little constituencies, but, you know, very quickly, what did we learn? And let's try to do this, like, snappy and quick, um, is how, what did we learn about all these different constituencies? What did we learn about the varieties of the African American vote, the varieties of the Latino vote, the varieties of the Native American vote, the varieties of the lady votes, you know, <laughs> LGBT, Asian Americans, um, some thoughts. I would say what we learned was, one, we had to message about our democracy right, the constitutional right. The larger race piece didn't resonate well with our groups. We also learned that um, early voting didn't always protect our vote. Montana, early voting was for eight days everybody, every place else, but on a reservation you only got one day. Um, what we learned was that the long lines across the country means that we got to be prepared and be really stay on top of this because we are going to see election reform. We're going to have electronic ballots. We're going to be able to have a different kind of mail-in um, voting across places that we don't currently have. And that means it's always a place for us in that change environment that we've got to monitor. We saw what happened in Alaska, um, the redistricting totally changed the face of the legislature. It doesn't look like Alaska anymore. 20% Alaska Natives don't look like 20% Alaska Natives or even 17% or 15% in the state legislature. Jesus, you've been a little quiet. I think that for both parties, the Latino vote was a priority. 71% of Latino voters voted for Obama. It was, it was actually 75. 75%. 75. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, voted for Obama. And uh, I mean, I think that there's, you know, a, a dire need for immigration re reform and, and, a, and a crave to hold the president accountable, although it doesn't just impact the Latino community, right? Uh, but I think um, also young people did come out the vote. I don't know the, the, the same statistic, but, but on a local tip, I think that uh, there was some discouragement, right, because folks are discontent with how the representation has been the last four years, but I also feel like people still came out and supported them. Um, and so that's, I, yeah. Okay. Latino, um, I think the Latino vote was a determining factor in this election. And, um, you know, and Asian American voter, you know, everybody keeps talking about the Latino vote and that has to what? do a lot with numbers. Mm -hmm. um, people don't talk quite as much about the Asian American vote, but the Asian American vote percentage wise was even higher. I think it was yeah. like 76%. Hey. So, so, any other any other thoughts from uh, folks on these different sub constituencies of votes? If we can speak to about them identity wise, um, I think that we learned um, that uh, two things. One that we cannot take for granted our access to democracy. That people will go to any extent to resolve something, that, to, to, to challenge something that we thought was resolved in 1965. Um, and um, that, that notwithstanding, uh, that uh, black people are not prepared to just sit back. Uh, it stood out, one of the stories that, that struck me the most over the course of, uh, of the election season was in Pennsylvania, um, when uh, some of the Republican leaders started saying that the reason people don't want to get voter IDs is because they're lazy. That, that they're too lazy to go get an ID. Um, Wait, hey, black people lazy? I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that and that all these, all these blacks and immigrants and poor folks, y'all just lazy. 
And, um, and so what was one of the things that was really empowering to me and uh, really moving to me uh, was to see that, you know, uh, folks stood online for eight hours despite you uh, and your efforts to keep us out of democracy. Um, so we learned yeah. we're not lazy. Although one of the things that, oh, I'm sorry, Sal. No, no, I, I also do think, though, you know, going forward, uh, this is something that's working on, you know, having to wait in line six, seven hours to vote, that is a modern poll tax. I mean, there are people who cannot afford to wait in line, who cannot get the time off, who cannot. That is not encouraging our democracy participation. Um, uh, you know, I never like being put in the position of having to speak for white people. I feel very, you know, tokenized. <laughs> oh, come on. Whatever, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of white people out there who are scared right now. <laughs> Not the people in this room, I think they're cool, but if you see any out there, like when you go back home, you know, like proceed with caution, don't hug them or anything, you know, maybe just give them a little pat on the back, like, you know, I know it's been hard, y'all had power for centuries and centuries, <laughs> thought that was going to continue, you know. Um, I think a lot has been made of that sort of white anxiety, which I, I will say I, I optimistically think is overblown because I think the Republican Party has systematically um, stoked that. But I think a lot of, uh, you know, there are in fact a lot more folks out there who actually are like pissed at their party, that their party is so behind on gay marriage and on immigration and on, right? So I actually think that hopefully what we're seeing is a shift in uh, our understanding and some white people's understanding of the world around them where, where they see that there is more promise and potential and, and joy for them, a better life for them and for their kids and for their future in the new America than in the old America. I think we have to help them get there. I also want to say, like, because this has been a down conversation at point, like, let's not forget something. If y'all don't know this, for the first time in history, the Democratic caucus in Congress yeah. will not be a majority white men. We got a long way to go, but that is, we are getting close to a country to where our leaders represent our voters right. truly, and that is, that is really something we should tell And all, I mean, and all the women that got elected to Congress, I mean, you know, the vaginal probe, you know, you just mentioned vaginal probe to women, you're done, you're totally done. So perhaps they will reinvent that again in two years to get a, um, us to turn out in large numbers. But I think that clearly um, helped a lot of us have clarity around where we stood. <laughs> All right. So um, I know we're. I, hopefully, a lot of this has gotten you with you know riled up to ask more questions and have more discussion and you know, fight, uh, fight out a lot of how we're going to do this. I think uh, one word that came up a lot um, is fear, you know. Our fears, uh, our allies' fears, the fears of the people that are on the opposite side from us. And I think maybe one of the things that we do really need to start thinking about, and this is scary, is to not think from fear, is to not plan from fear, to not act from fear. And that is going to be a challenge. So I, I really want to thank uh, this really fabulous, quick. fabulous panel. Really quick. Okay, Jesus gets the last word. We're gonna just keep punning on his name. Jesus gets the last word. I just feel like um, don't don't take action based off your anger. You should be angry, right? But take let your action be rooted in the love for your people. And I feel like, because I know that some of this stuff, and also don't be afraid to talk about race, because it's real, yeah. it's in our face all the time, um, and don't put it in the back burner. Man. Like, I think we have a, a, a great opportunity, especially over this weekend, to talk about this stuff. So let's get this weekend popping, y'all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jackie, Jesus, and Judith, thank you very much.